Good afternoon and welcome to the Board of Pharmacies webinar. Um, I'm Tom Glinsky, Chief Inspector with the Board. Today our guest is Michael Boger, the Administrator for the Missouri Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. He's going to give us an update from uh, the Bureau. Uh, before we start the webinar, I'm going to go through just some general housekeeping items about the webinar. If you've not been on our webinars before, um, anyone on the webinar is in listen-only mode. If you do have trouble listening over the internet, there is a telephone option on your GoToWebinar um, page on, that's on your screen that you can dial that number and use the access code to listen by telephone. The, um, here's an example of what that looks like. The, um, you only get credit for CE if you're signed in, so if you're just dialing in on the telephone uh, and not online, you will not get CE credit. It has been approved for one and a half hours of CE, you, and as I said, you must be signed in online to get that credit, and listening by telephone only will not get you the credit. At the end of the program, there's a post-survey you must complete in order to um, get your credit. Uh, we found out that um, people listening on, watching on a um, notebook or on a um, telephone might not be able to receive the post survey. You'll have there'll be instructions at the end on how you can email us if you didn't get it, and we can email it to you. We will take questions at the end. You can answer questions throughout uh, by going to the Go to Webinar page and. Um, uh, some, type in your question and then hit send. Um, we will look at those at the end and answer questions at the end of the program. Um, we will only be answering questions related to the topic today, which is um, from the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. So now I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Mike. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us today, Mike. Okay. Thank you for having me in today. I always like the opportunity to come and speak and talk about what's going on at the Bureau and provide updates. Uh, I've prepared some slides that I shared earlier this year at the Missouri Pharmacy Association Convention to just talk about current events, uh, some Bureau statistics updates on legislation and some statistics and address some of the issues that we get our most frequent pharmacy calls about. So looking at our agenda, I briefly want to talk about some of the Bureau statistics during the past year, our new website links and emailing us, status of legislation, reporting prescription fraud, the recent issue we had this past year with pre-populated prescription forms, and then a little bit about the uh, NPLEX Sudafed system. This first slide talks about just some of the things that the Bureau has done during the past uh, year. We currently have 29,776 registrants in the state of Missouri that can conduct activities with controlled drugs. Uh, that's the highest number that we've ever had. Uh, our statistics show that our registrants are going up. Uh, they have consistently always gone up for the last 16 years. So we are not seeing shortages in any of our registrant uh, practitioner areas. We're going from a three-year cycle back to a one-year cycle. That's because of our new online database. We got money from the uh, grant money that if we do an annual survey to determine where all the practitioners are for practitioner shortage areas, we can also use that money to run our new database. So we're going back to a one-year registration. That way we're not losing track of where all the doctors are and it prevents them from expiring. So we're issuing anywhere from about nine 9,000 registrations a year uh, is what we were doing, but now that cycle is changing. We will eventually be doing about all 30,000 registrants every year. We processed 2,431 address or name changes. The telephone calls is how many come into our central office only. That doesn't include the investigators out in the field. We had 798 lost reports. 
the Bureau went to 111 meetings. Our website received over 274,000 hits. We've really updated our website. Uh, you can apply online. You can check a registration online. You can print your own certificates online. And we have an email link there where you can send us questions. So people can always verify a doctor's registered by typing his name into our website. So we're seeing a big increase in our website hits. We did 99 inspections during the past year and completed 64 investigations. The number of inspections is going down because our inspectors are tied up doing more investigations. Uh, there's more complaints. There seem to be more violations when we get there, and it's taking a longer period of time. So the availability to go around and do random free inspections, the inspections have decreased. We did 10 educational classes or presentations uh, throughout the year. We averaged, we try to average about one a month over the years. On the disciplinary side, we've issued, uh, as a result of our investigations, we did six letters of warning, nine letters of censure. Those are non-public documents that stay in a file. They're not shared with the public. We put 17 registrants on probation. And then we had 13 registrants voluntarily surrender their registration in lieu of revocation. And all of those are cases where they are illegal possession, illegal distribution, drug abuse, selling prescriptions, that type of a, of a violation. Uh, and all of the statistics and everything I've just shared with you is done by the Bureau uh, where there's myself, two office support staff, and two investigators. One of the big things we wanted to share with everybody is to make use of our Bureau's website. Uh, we provide the address there. If you want to go to it and save it on your computer as a favorite, you can apply online or you can print an application if you want to mail it in. We always try to keep our list of controlled drugs by name and schedules updated. Our educational handouts are there, links to our statutes and regulations. There's forms out there for loss reports. Uh, we now have our loss report form in a PDF format that you can actually type on. So you can just type on it and then print it. You can also search and find a registrant online by typing in their name and actually see their, that they're registered. And you can see if they've ever been disciplined or if they're on probation now. And because we're so busy all day long, as the pharmacies are with telephone calls. You don't have a lot of time to make telephone calls or to be placed on hold. It's easier and faster, we find, if you email us a question. That way you can go back to work, continue to fill prescriptions, deal with your customers. We will respond to your email, and that way you not only get your questions answered, uh, you're not tied up on the phone, but when you get an answer from us, you'll get it in writing. A lot of what people are asking for is a copy of a statute or a rule or how something gets dispensed or where they can find something. So we find the email option is, is working great for us. Uh, we're averaging several of those a day uh, from pharmacies asking us questions about a rule on something. Legislative issues that uh, have been going on during the last year or so, we're trying to update our list of controlled drugs so it matches the DEA list. So we are working on that. They have added more chemical compounds to the list of Schedule I substances that are either being sold as bath salts or they're this new synthetic cannabinoid that kids are abusing. There has been ongoing legislation to create a prescription drug monitoring program. That was filed this last year. It got one hearing in the Senate in a subcommittee, but then after that it did not go any farther. So that's one of those issues that it seems to get filed every year, but it just doesn't make it through the legislative process. And then there was a legislation filed this past year that would make it a crime to falsify a drug test, and I don't believe that passed. That did not go through. 
One of the common questions that we get from doctors and pharmacies is when they find out that there is prescription fraud. The patient either has totally phoned in or created a false or forged prescription, or they've altered it. They've changed the quantity, they've added a drug to it, they've done something to alter or make a false prescription. Uh, any act of fraud is not covered by HIPAA or the state's confidentiality statute. So that's something that you can report to law enforcement. Uh, it's also grounds to fire a patient and not fill their prescriptions if that's your choice. But it's not something you always have to report to BNDD. Uh, it's something you can report to local law enforcement. We don't license or regulate or have control over what a patient does. But if they try to get drugs falsely, that's a Class D felony. You can call your local law enforcement and report that. You can share it with them. You can give them the prescription. That's a choice you make. And you're just the reporter. You're a complainant. It's up to the police to actually go make their own case. They'll come and interview you, interview the doctor. They'll get a copy of the prescription. It'll be up to the police to make their own case and make an arrest. So you don't have to worry about liability on that. We've had an issue this past year that I wanted to review. The DEA issued a reminder uh, about pre-populated prescription forms. And the reason for that was there were some cases where patients received too many drugs too soon, too fast. The patient had an adverse health event. They ended up being poisoned or overdosed. They ended up in the emergency room. And the family was very upset, wanted to file a complaint, wanted to know how that happened. So when they went to the pharmacy, the pharmacist answer was, I dispensed what was prescribed. The doctor had a prescription for every one of these. I only dispensed them when the doctor said to. They communicated with the doctor. They sent the doctor faxes. The doctor signed off on them, so the pharmacies filled them. So the pharmacies kind of pointed towards the doctor. So when they went to interview the doctor, the doctor had a couple of different issues. The doctor's first answer was, well, the pharmacies are the dispensers. They're the pill counters. I rely on them to know what the patient's getting and how much and when. Uh, if the patient got it too much, they shouldn't have dispensed it. So they wanted to blame the pharmacist. The other issue was the doctor said he would write a prescription and authorize refills on it. So he knew the patient would get their original prescription and then refills, and then they shouldn't be coming back until they needed a whole new prescription. Well, on a regular basis, the pharmacy would be sending faxes to the doctor saying refill authorization. Uh, the patient needs medicine. Sign here if it's okay to refill this. Well, the doctor just thought the pharmacy was letting him know the patient was there to get a refill. And of course, the doctor authorized those, so it's okay. So the doctor would sign thinking the patient was picking up one of their refills. In all actuality, what was going on was the patient went through all of their drugs. They needed a whole new prescription. But the pharmacy was writing the word refill request on the top of it. So that kind of confused the doctors as well. Uh, but in the, in the case, what the DEA found was that because the pharmacies were using the word refill, the doctors thought that it was just a refill going on, and it was not an entirely new prescription. They found out that what was going on in the pharmacy was the pharmacies were doing the best they could to provide good customer service. The patient would show up, want a prescription, they would be out there would be no prescriptions left available. So they would say, let's contact the doctor, find out if it's okay to get a new one. They would fax the doctor the information, and if it was okay, 
get the doctor to sign off on it, making a new prescription. And it was all about customer service to the patient to try to get them a prescription. Uh, the problem is when something goes wrong, then everybody wanted to point their finger at somebody else. So what the DEA did is they really didn't issue a new ruling. They stepped in and they just reminded everybody what the existing federal regulation has said since 1970. And that is it's the doctor's job to do all the prescribing and to prepare the prescription. They tell the doctor exactly what has to be written and provided on the prescription form, and it's their job to do it. And when they issue that prescription, they have the primary prescribing responsibility for that prescription to make sure that it's fully documented and it meets all the requirements. They also tell the doctor that sometimes they're busy so they can have their agent, their employee, help prepare that prescription as long as it's the doctor who signs on the bottom line. Uh, in that same regulation, it goes on to tell the pharmacies that they have a secondary responsibility. They are the dispensers of the prescriptions. They are the gatekeepers. They receive a prescription. They look to make sure that it meets all requirements on its face. They believe it's issued in good faith. And then they will dispense it. If something is not completed, they can call the doctor, verify it. There's that certain list of things that you can add and fix. But the pharmacist cannot prepare the prescription for the doctor because they are not the doctor's agent. They are not the doctor's employee. They have their own separate registration. And they have total secondary responsibilities away from the doctor when it comes to dispensing. So the issue is make the doctors totally provide the pharmacies with a new prescription so the pharmacies can dispense it. The pharmacies are still welcome to communicate with the doctor, talk to the doctor, call the doctor, fax the doctor. You can email the doctor, but just say, the patient's here for a new prescription. They don't have any. We need a new prescription. You can tell the doctor, if in case they don't know, what the patient was getting previously. But do not prepare a prescription form for them to sign. Because that gives the pharmacy an active role in that prescribing process. And then it brings in your liability. Uh, so we want to protect the pharmacies and have not, we don't want pharmacies drug in to these cases when they determine that there was misprescribing, overprescribing, bad prescribing. Uh, make, make the prescribers totally do their own prescriptions so that all you have to do is just dispense them. And that's, the, that's what the federal law says and that's what they're asking the pharmacies to do. It protects the pharmacy. Uh, pseudofedrin sales in the NPLEX database. Uh, the NPLEX website provided by APRIS has information and forms and documents and things that they have on there to continue education with your pharmacy staff. When a customer's sale gets denied, the system just says it's denied, but it doesn't say why, because we don't want the customers arguing with pharmacy staff. So the pharmacy is just to provide the customer with a piece of paper that documents the date, the time, the pharmacy name, the transaction number, and then give that to the customer along with this website address. That's where the customers are supposed to go and they can contact and find out why they got denied. Uh, there's a website there that's specifically for the customers and if they give their name and the store, the date and the time, they'll communicate with them so the pharmacy doesn't have to. All they're asking the pharmacy to do is to give the customer a piece of paper that's got the date, the time, the store, and give them this website 
and then they'll take care of it with the customers from there. Uh, we put this slide in and we also have some questions coming up on this today about the new laws concerning mid-level practitioners. There's two types in Missouri, the advanced practice nurses and the physician's assistants. They did the nurses law one year, they did the physician's assistants the following year, their laws do not match. So there's a difference between the PAs and the nurses. But both have to be in a collaborative or supervision agreement with a the physician. They each will have to go through a special training course approved by their board and get approval to apply. And then they will get their own BNDD number, they get their own DEA numbers. Once they have their own DEA numbers, they can write their own prescriptions. They don't have to be co-signed by anybody, by any doctor. They have their own independent authority once they get that DEA number. They cannot prescribe any Schedule II drugs. They're limited to Schedules 3, 4, and 5 only. And they cannot prescribe controlled drugs to any family members. And that goes out for generations, not only for them, but also for their in-laws on both sides of their family. So they cannot prescribe for their grandma or grandpa, they cannot prescribe for their in-laws. The nurses, if they are prescribing a Schedule three opiate narcotic, they are limited to a five-day supply with no refills. But one of the things they can do is they can write a prescription for hydrocodone for five days, and then they can issue a whole new prescription every five days, as long as they're not using the word refill. With physician's assistants, the difference is all Schedule three drugs are limited to a five-day supply. So with them, the number one thing we see that they may be prescribing is if they are helping with testosterone therapy. That's a Schedule three, but they're limited to a five-day supply on that. So that's the difference between the physician's assistants and the nurses is that Schedule threes for PAs, they have a five-day supply on everything, but for nurses, they only gave them a five-day supply on the opiates. But both can have full prescribing privileges for all the other drugs that would be in Schedules 4 and 5. Mid-level practitioners, practitioners when they prescribe from out of state, there's a lot of confusion when people read the statute because they used a phrase in there from another state. Uh, it makes more sense to them because they wrote it as Missourians, so we're talking about the other 49 states. But when you're reading it from out of state, they might be prescribing to a Missouri patient, well that's a person in another state. So. We're going to try to clean this up and make it easier to understand and actually put the state's name in there. But what their intent is, they want Missouri patients to always get the same amount of dispensing limits that all Missouri patients get by Missouri law. And they want Missouri practitioners to prescribe according to what Missouri law says. But because we have some retail mail order pharmacies, they ship prescriptions around the country for other doctors and other patients in other states. They wanted to be able to dispense according to the laws of those states. So that's why they wrote this section of the statute. If a patient in Alaska gets a prescription from their doctor in Alaska, we want to be able to fill that and mail it out according to the laws of Alaska. And that's what they were trying to do. But as it stands right now, to, to, we're going to try to clean that up. But the examples that I've given you, if a Kansas nurse writes a prescription for a Missouri patient, 
the five-day opiate supply applies because the patient is from Missouri. And if it's a Kansas nurse and a Kansas patient, well, then you can dispense that according to the Kansas law, whatever that is. So the easiest way we've been able to explain it to the practitioners and the pharmacies is when you get these prescriptions in, ask yourself this one question. Is the prescriber or the patient from Missouri? If either one of these people is from Missouri, then the Missouri dispensing laws apply. But if the prescriber and the patient are both from another state and no Missourian is involved, then you can dispense it according to the laws of that state where it was written. So. That's the simplest way we've been able to explain it so far. And then we have an informational sheet here about additional resources. If you want to contact our bureau, here's our contact information, phone, fax, website, and our email uh, could be the fastest for you. How to get in touch of the DEA depends on which side of the state you're on. It's basically Highway 63 is the dividing line. If you are on 63 or west, you go to the Overland Park office. If you are east of Highway 63, you can contact the St. Louis office. So that kind of concludes the things I had to go over, and now we'll review some of the questions we've had submitted. Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, again, if you'd like to submit a question, uh, go to your GoToWebinar screen, uh, type the question, and hit Send. Um, before we get started on questions, Mike, I just had a, wanted to some clarification on the last topic about nurse practitioners and out-of-state. Um, your November newsletter had a table in it that actually said you, um, the five-day limit did not apply. So has that been, is that a revision to that? There, that will be revised and changed or pulled because it had to go through a lot of uh, levels. It goes from our bureau through the division to public information through legal. But uh, there's confusion caused by the phrase and the statute, practitioner in another state and a patient in another state. And it doesn't name any state. So we're going to fix that. Okay. We're going to um, now start taking some of the questions. Um, we get a lot of questions, just the same topic about nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Um, can you, they would clear, could you clarify again, go over what, kind of some, what you just said. Some of the questions are, um, can the collaborating doctor's name be added to the Rx? They, they, they could, I think, and, and this is one of the things I think they're trying to fix in the session. It's, they've tried to get it past the last couple of years. They did not do this for the nurses, but for the physician's assistants, the name of their supervising physician has to be printed on the label. Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to know what it is on the prescription. So that's one of those things that you can add. If you know who their supervising physician is, you can add that and write it down. It has to be on the label, so you can put it on the prescription. Uh, that, that's an ad that you can do yourself in the pharmacy. Okay. Um, this, here's a question about the labeling. Can you go elaborate more on the labeling requirement for a prescription with a nurse practitioner or physician assessment? Does the collaborating or supervising physician have to be on the label along with them, or is it both? Or It's only if the prescription is written by a physician's assistant. Uh, the labeling law has always been a federal law. And all 50 states want to just obey the federal law because it's the same across the country. But when they did the physician's assistant law, they wanted the name of their supervising doctor printed somewhere on the label. So that applies to those practitioners. Okay. The next has to do with uh, what security measures are required on the actual hard copy prescription. 
there are several different statutes that talk about what has to be written and provided on a prescription. The BNDD matches the DEA federal law of what has to be on a prescription. The Board of Pharmacy has a statute, I believe it's 338.056, that talks about what has to be on a prescription form. The requirement to use security paper that's tamper-proof is a federal requirement from Medicaid Medicare. It's not a statute or law of the BNDD or the DEA, and we don't enforce that. The security paper requirement is all about reimbursement. If you want reimbursement for the prescription, they want you to use the security paper. So we're seeing those prescribers use security paper. But what we don't want to see is a pharmacy turn away a prescription if it's written by somebody who's not even in the Medicaid program. We have a lot of dentists out there who aren't even in the Medicaid program and they don't get reimbursement, so they don't use security paper. We've unfortunately had veterinarians have prescriptions turned away because they didn't use security paper. Well, they're not in the Medicaid program. So the requirement to use security paper is by those who want to be reimbursed for it. And that's where that security paper comes from. Okay, next is, does a pharmacist have to sign the face of a prescription when dispensing it? No, they do not. That was a uh, statute that existed a number of years ago, but over the course of time, with the advent of computers, we did away with that. The Board of Pharmacy removed their requirement, the EA removed their requirement, our Bureau removed its requirement. We know that there's a dispensing record. It's on the sticker that's on the back of the prescription. It's in the computer. So there's, there's no need to sign the face of the prescription any longer. That, that's not in our statute. This has to do with moving a pharmacy. Do you need to do you need a new BNDD registration if you move a pharmacy within the same building? Not as long as the major street address has not changed. You can move from one suite to another suite or from the first floor to the second floor. We just need to know what physical street address you're at. Uh, we've never really had a problem with somebody changing from the first floor to the third floor or from suite one to suite three. Uh, you can just let us know because we always need to be able to send you mail. We're going to send you postcards to remind you when it's time to reapply. So always let us know when you do move and we'll take care of that for free. We'll always update your registration for free if you notify us timely. But you don't need to get a new registration if you're staying in the same building. And you can always call us and, and let us know that and we'll discuss it with you. Okay. Could you go over all the information, software requirements, servers, computers, printers, etc., uh, for e-prescribing of controlled substances? The uh, Tom's, Tom's smiling at me here. The federal rule by the DEA of what is required for federal prescribing, it covers what's required by the practitioners who are sending the prescriptions, and then the rule covers rules for the pharmacies who will receive the prescriptions. And then there's rules in there for the hospitals and how they will handle things. The rule is, if I'm not mistaken, several hundred pages long. Uh, just the physical note of the cost was several hundred pages by itself. Uh, in our Bureau's website, if you go to the BNDD website in our newsletters, we talk about electronic prescribing and what the general requirements are. And we have a link there under our educational handouts if you want to go right to the DEA rules for electronic prescribing, you can click on it, and we've downloaded it there as a PDF document. 
that you can scroll through it and save it. Uh, you probably won't want to print it because it's a very thick, voluminous document. But the basic premises of the, the DEA rule for electronic prescribing, the major points are this. The doctor is going to have to have a computer device that they can prepare a prescription on and then hit a send button so it gets transmitted electronically. The prescription has to meet all the requirements and contain all the information that's required. The hardware that the doctor's using, their computer, has to have security on it. It has to have a password. It has to have some type of a token that he can plug in so that we know it's the doctor doing the transmitting. Uh, he has to plug in a card, a thumb drive, some type of a physical token so that we know that somebody just didn't grab his computer and start prescribing without their permission. Uh, if they don't do that, they have to have a biometric on it, like an eye scanner or a thumbprint reader. But there's different levels of security these doctors have to have. They have to transmit it on software that's been approved by the DEA. They have auditing companies that will come out visit and examine software before you can electronically prescribe you have to be using software that's already been examined and approved so the doctors need to know that this does not give them permission to email you cannot write a far a, a prescription and send it in an email the DEA likewise has similar requirements for what happens in the pharmacy. These prescriptions are going to arrive on your computer in an electronic format where you'll be able to read them, store them, type on them, note changes or any documentation that you want. But then the pharmacy has to be able to save it into an archive, some type of a file serving system. A big part of the DEA rule says that whatever starts out electronic has to stay electronic and it can never become paper. So that means that when that doctor sends it, it goes from the doctor's computer to the pharmacy's computer. It cannot go to your fax machine because a fax is paper and it requires an ink signature on it before it's sent. So. If, a, if you get a prescription that looks like it's electronic and it comes to your fax machine, that's not legal for dispensing. Legal electronic prescribing by DEA rules go from computer to computer and they never become paper. So the DEA put out all these requirements so we have software companies rushing out there to come up with new software. They're selling them to the doctors. The doctors want to start electronically sending prescriptions. But then they got to have a pharmacy that's set up also. We've got areas of the state where large clinics and doctors have set up the software to electronically prescribe, but the pharmacies in their area are not set up to receive yet. So we have to wait to get both ends of the deal there. Right now where our state is with it is we are in the process of having our state rule match the federal rule. BNDD is not going to get involved in rewriting rules and making you do anything new or extra. We're going to take our existing rules and we're just going to add a phrase to them that says that all registrants can participate in electronic prescribing as authorized by the DEA and federal regulations 1300 to N. So basically we're just going to say ditto, do what the DEA does, do what they say, and that's going to be okay with us. We're not going to have any new additional state rules over electronic prescribing. So we've drafted those rules. They're going through the process. They have been since 
I think February of 2010 or 11 when the rules went through. February 15, 2011 is when we drafted them and started them through the process. Uh, it's a long process, but we're on our way to getting that done. But that's kind of where we are on the e-prescribing. Okay, please review the role of technicians in handling and processing in the pharmacy. Okay, and this is something I'll have to ask for Tom to help weigh in on because there are certain issues here that the BNDD does not address. But we know that the technicians have to be registered with the state board. That means that the pharmacy employer has done a criminal records background check because no employee can be in the pharmacy if they have any type of an arrest, guilty plea, or a conviction, even probation, for a drug offense. Uh, they have to get a waiver from our bureau first, the pharmacy does. The BNDD and the DEA, we register the store. The pharmacy is a business, but we do not register or regulate the individual employees in the store. We do not do the pharmacist or the technicians. The Board of Pharmacy primarily dictates what technicians can do. Uh, I reviewed our rules for this and we know that the technicians check in orders and they do what's delegated to them within the scope of their authority. So we know they run the cash register and they check in orders and they'll keep records and they'll inventory things and that they practice under the supervision of a pharmacist. The state and federal rule both say that when something is telephoned in, the state and federal regulations say that oral telephone prescriptions get reduced in writing. It says by the pharmacist. Now, I don't know if the board has updated that, but I don't know, do technicians take phone ins and write it? Uh, we would not prohibit that. However, federal, federal law would be stricter. Right, okay. So the DEA says that if it's a controlled substance prescription, the pharmacist needs to be the one to take the phone in. But I would agree and know that that rule was written in 1970 before we had a lot of telephone prescriptions and before we had registered technicians. So that's not something that I can tell you that the Bureau has ever cited in a pharmacy. Uh, for We just want the prescription to be written down. So as long as it's logged in correctly, that's, that's what we look at. And of course we know that the technicians can never dispense on their own. There always has to be a pharmacist on duty before the dispensing takes place. Okay. If a Missouri doctor issues a C2 prescription on a prescription blank and the bottom of the RX only has one line, can we call the doctor and verify the information to fill the script? If the RX does not have a dual signature lines, will a new prescription have to be written? Uh, our Bureau and the DEA, we don't have all of the laws and regulations that require the dual signature lines on a prescription. That's something that's in the Board of Pharmacy Practice Act. Uh, the section that says there has to be two lines at the bottom is in section 338.056. Uh, whether it's going to say dispense is written or substitution permitted. What the BNDD and the DEA looks at is was it written by a doctor with a DEA number? Is it legally written? Does it have all the elements on it? And did the doctor sign it? Uh, I think the pharmacy law talks about that the pharmacist has the right and can substitute so you can still practice within your authority under that. It's not our bureau that would get into whether it's dispenses written or substitution permitted. If you're going to call the doctor and verify what they want, you can certainly do that. If they want the brand name, dispense that. But if they say no, generic is okay, uh, there's a pharmacy section, a statute that talks about substitution being permitted you're not changing the overall therapy, the, the drug. And I can tell you that the board would not object to a pharmacist calling and, and uh, confirming what, 
the prescriber's intention on substitution was. We would not require them to get a new written prescription. Yeah, the only time we're running into a problem with that, and, and we're running into this, and we don't have a choice on this, but for some reason we're having a doctor write a prescription for a drug that doesn't even exist. Uh, then you have no choice. There is no substitution. And that's the name of a drug. So in that case, they normally have to call the doctor and say, you have to rewrite it because we don't have that strength, or that does not come with an immediate release or an extended release. So that's kind of like educating the doctor. You make them rewrite it, and maybe they'll catch on that there's no such drug. The next one deals about uh, the BNDV's requirement to report uh, losses. Um, it states that because um, BND requires um, all losses that uh, when it cannot be accounted for, be reported, it's a deterrent for pharmacies to conduct routine audits. Yeah, the, uh, the, there's kind of a, of a give and take there. We want registrants to keep their drugs secure, and we want them to be accountable, and we want them to know what they've got, where it's at, what they should have. And if any of it's missing, we want them to know that. So we do want you to conduct periodic audits. That's how you find out if you're having theft and diversion. And when you do conduct these audits, we know that from time to time you're going to find out that you are two tablets off, one percent off, ten tablets off. Uh, those things happen. And we get loss reports on those all the time. Being short a few tablets is not going to send a BNDD inspector into your pharmacy. Uh, we have never taken a disciplinary action on a pharmacy because they were missing a handful of tablets on an audit. What we are looking for is diversion. Somebody who's in there stealing on a regular basis and they're doing it daily or weekly. And that's what you're protecting yourself against. They're going to steal a little bit, but they're going to do it every day. And then it adds up. So all of a sudden, when I look back at the Bureau's disciplinary actions over the past several years, all of the pharmacies that we've disciplined for having drug diversion, they all had one thing in common. They all lost drugs in the range of 8,000 doses to 70,000 doses. So don't be afraid to do audits. We want you to do audits. Don't be afraid to report that you're off a few here or there, a very small percentage here or there, because we know that happens and we know why. But these other pharmacies that get into trouble, they end up missing thousands of dosage units because they're not doing routine audits. And we want you to do routine audits. And don't be afraid to turn those in because we see patterns sometimes that nobody else sees. And we know backgrounds of all other employees that be there that other people may not know. So don't be afraid to turn in the loss reports. We, we will not do what the DEA does and say, don't report insignificant audits because the DEA does not find, define insignificant. So we've had doctors who lost 5,000 pills in a week, and they didn't report it because they didn't think it was significant. And BNDD could deal with that. But the DEA couldn't. Their hands were tied. So that's why the DEA doesn't let people slide with insignificant reporting. Can you explain the requirements for the pharmacists in charge to review the pseudoephedrine log on a monthly basis? Yeah, that rule was put in there when our rules committee was coming up with rules for the pseudofed database system. 
and looking at what was going on at the time, we were having significant diversion in pharmacies, and it was usually the majority of time all by the technicians, and they altered computer records. If technicians have the ability to enter the drugs, enter inventories, put in sales or dispensing data, and then they can go in and change or alter the inventory number, that's where diversion occurs. So one of the things we knew that was going to happen was that meth cooks are going to get a friend inside the pharmacy who works inside a pharmacy to sell them Sudafed and then somehow change the records. And we knew it was going to happen, and it has happened. We've already had a couple of cases of this. So what we want the pharmacist to know is when your technicians go in there and change records, we just want you to know about it. If they're altering a sale, deleting a sale, changing a record, they're selling Sudafed, but then they want to go in there and take it out, we want you to know about these changes. So we know that if they're selling Sudafed, the sale is always in the database. But we want the pharmacist to know when changes are being made and records are being deleted. So that's what the rule says, is to go in once a month, look at changes, alterations, and deletions, and just look at them so you know they're there. So what most of the pharmacies are doing is they'll go into the NPLEX database system. They can ask to see returns and deletions, and it'll pop up for them on the screen. The pharmacist will just print those and put them in a book. And that kind of shows that somebody's looking at it monthly, and it lets all the pharmacy employees know that they're being looked at monthly, and that when they're selling Sudafed, it's not going to work for you to make a sale and then try to delete it. So that was the premise behind the entire thing, that NPLEX has that data. You can look at it. You can print it. You can keep a log. Just put it in that notebook. Okay. Got a couple questions, I think, related to your statistics pages. Um, you mentioned that you, the Bureau got a grant. They were asking who, who provided the grant. The grant for the database came from the Division of Community and Public Health in our department. It's given through the Office of Public Health, Public and Rural Community Health. It's their job to know where all the practitioners are in the state of Missouri and where they're at because they determine practitioner shortage areas so that when doctors come out of medical schools, if they owe student loans back, if they're here on a J-1 work visa, if they're required to work in an underserved area, they have to come to the Department of Health to find out where those areas are. So our department has to know where everybody is. So they were doing an annual survey. Well, by getting some grant money, they were able to say, let's combine our survey with the BNDD application so that we'll just ask them once a year, who are you, what's your license, where do you practice? We'll pull all of our data from that. That way we only bother the doctors once a year. They get a BNDD registration, and then we know where they're at. We capture that data. And money has been given to the department from various resources. We're using some of the funds the department already has. We're replacing a database that needed to be replaced. There's been some local community public health dollars that have been put into that. Uh, the Division of Community Public Health has put the money into that. So that's where all of that money is coming from. Uh, it did not come from fees that BNDD collects. Uh, so that, that's, it's one of these things where we are, we are being gifted a new database, which is great, but in this process, BNDD did not have to use its fee money for it. Let's see, we have a question. When you mentioned um, 
renewals and applications being rejected, they were wondering what's the most common reason for a renewal to be rejected? If you apply online, sometimes there's a glitch in the system and the application gets rejected. And here's the number one reason. When you apply online, it's going to ask you right off the bat, are you an existing registrant or is this your first time? If you're a first time applicant, you have to type in and fill in all the blanks. But if you're an existing registrant and you're just getting like a renewal, it's going to ask you to type in some identifiers because it's going to go out and find you. And hopefully a lot of those fields and questions will be pre-populated. You can type in like your name, other identifiers, your license number, date of birth, a social security number, and it's going to go out and it's going to verify who you are. And it's going to bounce you off of your professional board license so that we know you're a physician, that we know you're a dentist, uh, things like that. And it's going to identify your name and your license number so that we know you are who you say you are. Now, It'll kick you back and it will say invalid login credentials if the name you have with us does not match what you've turned into the state board for your license. So if your name isn't the same, if your date of birth is a number off, if your social security number is a number off, if your license number is a number off, it kicks back a rejection. And examples I'll give you if I get my medical license under Michael Boger, but then I apply for my BNDB under Mike, it kicks it back. If my medical license starts with two zeros and my number is 00314, but then when I apply for BNDD, I just put in 314. I don't put the zeros in front of it. It kicks it back. So that's our number one reason for rejections is that state license boards don't have matching information that we do. And we have to match them up to make sure we've got the right person. Let's see, the next question is, will pharmacies need to maintain a signature logbook in the future for BNDD DEA? Let me clarify, the board is making a rule change that will become effective at the end of August, uh, doing away with our requirement to keep a signature logbook if you're using a computer system, um, that the DEA will still have their requirements. So if you do do control substances, you will still be required to keep the signature logbook. Um, they actually have the option of also doing a printout and reviewing the printout and signing that. The DEA still has that option. Um, but that's, and that question stems from an up-and-coming rule change. Okay. And if the DEA still requires it, then we will all have to do it because that will still be the federal law. Should pharmacies not pre-populate any drug for Rx renewals or just for narcotics? The DEA's ruling is do not pre-populate any prescription forms for any controlled substances in any schedule. So that would include not only narcotics, but benzodiazepines, stimulants, depressants, everything. Anything, and it's a liability question. The DEA has already said, don't pre-populate any controlled substances. That's what the DEA has authority over. Now, here's the question you have to ask yourself. What if it's not a controlled substance? Do you want to pre-populate a prescription for blood pressure medicine? If you do that, you're opening up yourself for liability if there's a problem there. But that's a choice you get to make. <laughs> Can a nurse practitioner or physician assistants prescribe for their supervising physician or their family? I, I don't have it in front of me. I, it's under the Practice Act, but I think that the Board of Healing Arts Statutes in Chapter 334 prohibits them for prescribing for coworkers and colleagues. That's under the Board of Healing Arts in Chapter 334. I'm not sure exactly which section that's in. 
Are nurse practitioners able to prescribe other Schedule III drugs without the day limitation, or can they only write for narcotic opiates? They can write for all Schedule III drugs. No matter what the drug is in Schedule III, they can write for all of them. Now, if it's an opiate, they're limited to a five-day supply. But they can write for a full course of therapy for testosterone, any other drug that is not an opiate. There's one clarification. If a pain clinic nurse practitioner in Kansas sees a Missouri patient every month, would they have to have the doctor sign the prescription? Well, there's no requirement for a DEA registrant like this nurse to write the prescription to have a doctor co-sign it. Uh, we get a lot of questions about do doctors have to co-sign a prescription. There's no requirement that I'm aware of, DEA and BNDD, for a doctor to co-sign. Uh, the DEA registrant signs the prescription. The person who is not the registrant should not be signing it. So there should only be one signature on a prescription. Now, sometimes I think they have it as an office policy. Maybe the doctor does this. Maybe the doctor tells his staff, you might sign it, but I want to see it and I want to approve it. Maybe that's just an internal policy. But uh, if the nurse in Kansas writes the prescription and it's a Missouri patient, so it's for a five-day supply, you can dispense that. Uh, don't need the doctor's signature. If the doctor wants them to have a full 30-day supply, well, then the doctor should just sign it. And there's no need for the nurse to sign it. If, if, if a Kansas nurse practitioner writes for an Oklahoma patient, what set of out-of-state laws would they be, Missouri pharmacists, need to follow? The state where the practitioner wrote the prescription. Because they can only prescribe according to their state law and license. So you go by the state where the prescriber was. If a physician assistant has a DEA, DEA number licensed with 2 and 2N, are they allowed to write C2 prescriptions? Yes, because the state of Missouri found it redundant on a drug registration to put 2 and 2 in, and then 3 and 3 in. So we just, on our registration, we put 2, 2 in, 3. The DEA does that. We don't. Their, their question was about a physician assistant, though. Yeah, they can't write for 2 and 2 right. in in Missouri. Uh, so they so there should So an example would be an out-of-state physician assistant who may have the authority in Iowa, who also has a practice here, they would have it on theirs for Iowa, but they would not. Right. And they're going to write it according to what Iowa law says. Is there a quick website to see what the other laws are for the other states when it comes to prescribing controlled substances? There's a couple of organizations out there that I'll, I'll mention here a couple of times so you can write it down. There's the uh, if you want to Google something or look up an organization, look up NASCA. It's the N-A-S-C-S-A. N-A-S-C-S-A. That stands for the National Association of State Controlled Substance Authorities. It's an organization of all 50 states and their BNDD organizations. Uh, all 50 states have state drug laws and they have a website that links to them. Now, only about 35 of the states or so have a state reg uh, bureau that's actually like BNDD. But they all have some organization that monitors their controlled drug practices, whether it's their board of pharmacy under medical examiners. In a couple of states, it's under the Department of Public Safety. All states have somebody. Uh, if you go to that website of that national organization, it will tell you who's a member, 
It'll give you a name, contact information. Usually can, you can go to their website. Uh, so that's one website you can try. A second one is the uh, National Association for Control Drug Laws, NACDL. Uh, that's an organization that tracks all 50 states' laws to try to make sure they're all the same or consistent as possible, where you can find out what other states are doing. That's another possible source. Can a Missouri pharmacist fill a C2 prescription from a nurse in Kansas? If the nurse has a DEA number and it was written legally in their state. Can we get a better definition of emergency for an emergency authorization for a C2 medication? The, 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 the defining term that uh, the BNDD goes by uh, stems from a couple of different cases. Number one, emergency meaning the patient really needs the medication, they have to have it, it is important for their therapeutic care at the time. You have a emergency situation. That's part one. Another part two is that there's no other alternative option available. Uh, we know that hospitals can dispense drugs, but they only dispense drugs when there's no pharmacy available. If there's a pharmacy available, we expect them to write a prescription. So emergency can sometimes be there's no pharmacy available or I can't get a prescription to the patient or something just happened, it's the middle of the night, it's after hours, uh, something like that. Sometimes the emergency is just the patient arrived in a nursing home and it's the middle of the night. Uh, they're trying to keep the patient's regimen going. So it's that type of, an, of a situation. It, it may not always mean life-threatening. If the patient and prescriber are both from another state, but want their prescription filled in Missouri, can the Missouri pharmacy fill it according to Missouri law, even if it's more stringent than the other states? I would say that the pharmacist has discretion to always do less if they choose to. Uh, although they could dispense according to the law of Kansas, the, the pharmacist would always have the right to say, you know, I'm going to fill this, but I'm only going to give you this much. Uh, the pharmacist always has discretion to dispense or to say no. Uh, and I would just say you just tell the patient what your thoughts are and what you want to do. Maybe they want to take their prescription somewhere else. But I would say you can do less. Could you please go over step by step how the emergency kit should be used and the drugs replaced to the emergency kit for a long-term care facility? Yes, and we have a rule for that. Uh, under the BNDD regulations on our website, it's rule 1.052. There's a rule there just for long-term care e-kits. And here's how the State Department of Health and Senior Services licenses and handles those e-kits. We make the nursing homes get their own separate BNDD number for that e-kit. So they are a registrant. They have a BNDD registration for that e-kit. The DEA does not register or regulate long-term care. They do not get DEA numbers for their e-kit. They totally leave it up to the state. So whatever the state decides, is what happens. So the rules are in place by the Department of Health and Senior Services for those e-kits. So the nursing homes have a registration with BNDD. They are allowed to go get their drugs and buy their drugs and get their drug supplies from 
a doctor, a hospital, or a pharmacy. Now, once their drugs are in their e-kit, they have to keep the same records everybody else does. They have to keep a complete receipt record of every drug that's come in with the name and address and the dates and the supplier's information for the drugs coming into the e-kit. And then they have to do an annual inventory. And then they have to keep a dispensing log. And every time they get into that kit, it's because they have a doctor's permission. They do what the doctor says. They dispense. They use the way the doctor the way the doctor said. They chart it. It goes in the patient's chart, and it gets written on that dispensing log. When our department goes in to do an inspection, we can look at that emergency kit, and we know what's in there, when they got it, they've inventoried it, and there's a log of every time they've used it. Now, state regulations from the department strictly prohibit the use of prescriptions in this entire system. Prescriptions are not to be used for a lot of reasons. Number one, you can't use prescriptions to buy drug stock. So you cannot stock the e-kit with a prescription. So that's one rule that's defined in there. If you consider those, those drugs are considered to be the property and the responsibility of long-term care. If there's a violation, if they're not keeping records, if there's bad security, the department disciplines the nursing home. So they are responsible. So just like a pharmacy can sell drugs to a doctor, we go in and inspect the doctor. If the doctor's not doing anything wrong, if they're messing up, we deal with the doctor. We don't go back and beat up on the pharmacy for that. Well, the pharmacy can provide drugs to the nursing home. We're going to hold the nursing home accountable. If they're messing up, we're going to deal with the nursing home, not the pharmacy. So the dispensing that occurs out of the e-kit for controlled drugs is by a doctor's order, no prescriptions. Uh, we've had some problems this past year where a patient had a bad emergency in the middle of the night. And what the department wants to happen is that the nurse calls the doctor, the doctor tells them what to do, the nurse has opened up the emergency kit, they provided immediate care, save the patient. That's the way things are supposed to happen. It's doctor dispensing on a doctor's order for drugs that are in that facility that the facility has. Okay, That's the way the system's supposed to work. But in this case, something bad happened. The patient had an emergency. They called the doctor. The doctor told them what to do. Uh, then the facility said, well, we can't get into the e-kit because we have to have the pharmacist permission. So they took the time in the middle of the night to track down the pharmacist. The pharmacist told them, you have to have a prescription. So then they had to run out and get some kind of a prescription and contact with the doctor again. And then the pharmacist called the doctor to make sure the doctor authorized it. When it all got ironed out, there was a two and a half hour delay before the patient got the medicine and we had a really bad event there. And those drugs are in the e-kit. You don't need a prescription because number one, Missouri law says no prescription shall be used. And number two, if the pharmacy wants to consider those drugs theirs and require a prescription, well, no, nothing can be dispensed without a pharmacist being present. That means you're telling that nurse to fill a prescription. They're not licensed to do that. And you can't dispense without a pharmacist being present. So you can't have it both ways. So what we want in Missouri, and the way they've written their laws for years, is that pharmacies can provide drugs to long-term care, let long-term care use them. They're going to use them on a doctor's order. There should be no prescriptions. Now, when the, when the nursing home uses those drugs, they can notify the pharmacy, hey, we use those drugs, 
so that you can supply them some more and refill their kit. But that's the way it's supposed to happen. Now, the downside of that is because there's no prescribing, well, the pharmacies can't bill Medicaid, Medicare for that. But they shouldn't anyway. That's the nursing homes issue. We treat nursing homes the same way we treat doctor's offices. Doctors can go buy drugs to use in their office, but we hold them accountable. You would not tell a doctor he has to go get a prescription before he can use his own medicine. Same thing with nursing homes. They're registered. They have drugs. They use them the way the doctor says. We hold them accountable. The pharmacies should not get involved when it comes time to dispense from the e-kit because that's what the state law has always said. Now, we've had one nursing home pharmacy business ask us to review that, check with the DEA. We wrote off and we asked the DEA, and they said that we are complying with what the federal law says. The DEA does not regulate nursing homes as long as the state does it. They want you to follow the state rules. They will allow pharmacies to put drugs into nursing homes, and they want you to have certain rules in place when that happens, and the state meets all that criteria. Now, states have the right to be stricter, and in the state of Missouri, the rule says no prescription shall be used. So that's the current law of the land, and, and it has been. Let's see. Kansas recently approved electronic prescribing of controlled substance. Is there legislation planned for this in Missouri? The electronic prescribing is not by statute. It's all in rule. And the DEA has changed their rule, so Missouri is updating and changing its rule. We're not going to need a statute to go through the legislature. Our department's doing it by rule because that's how our prescribing is. It's in the rules. So we're just going to say, ditto, do electronic prescribing the same way the DEA allows it. And we've been saying that all along. We've got some people out there right now today who are electronically prescribing, and we're telling them to follow the DEA guidelines. Does the patient address and Dr. DEA number have to be on the front of the hard copy or would a sticker applied by the pharmacy suffice on the back? And I assume they're talking about a prescription brought right. in by a patient. Yeah, because you know, the I can't contradict what the federal law says and I can't contradict what the Missouri legislature says in the statute. The state and federal law says that the doctor has to write a complete prescription with everything written on the face of the prescription so that's the name, the address, the DEA number, everything has to be written on there. The prescription is what the doctor writes on the face of the document. That's a prescription. That sticker that the pharmacy puts on the back is a dispensing record. So when you're looking at that piece of paper, what the doctor writes on the face is the prescription. What's on the back is the dispensing record sticker. So if the doctor doesn't write a complete prescription, you have the right to call them up and uh, add to it the things that you know you can add to it. But leaving it blank doesn't meet the statutory requirement of the DEA. You want clarification on, is a default fax legal when the electronic system is not working? That's a DEA question uh, over electronic prescribing. So I, I would defer to them on that. I would say that if you cannot get your electronic prescribing system to work, then issue the prescription another way. Whatever the law allows, write it on paper, fax it, phone it, find an alternative method, just like you would the days before there was electronic prescribing. 
do electronic prescriptions have to be printed for storage, or is it okay to keep them electronically as long as they're readily retrievable? The DEA federal rule says that they have to be maintained, readily retrievable electronically in a database archive system, and they are not supposed to be printed. Now, you're going to have the ability to print them because sometimes somebody might want a copy. You know, the Board of Pharmacy Inspector might show up, or DEA, or BNDD, and they might want a, a copy. You can bring up the prescription and look at it on the screen, and you'll print a copy for somebody like that. But as far as day-to-day -day filling of these prescriptions, they don't have to be printed at all. The DEA wants you to keep them electronic. With the popularity of automation in long-term care facilities, are there any special requirements for pharmacy to go through concerning control substances in that automation? Yes, there is. We've got some new things that have developed over the last couple of years that we're doing that's new. We now are allowing, and we're not talking about emergency kits, but we now have automated dispensing machines in nursing homes. Before, we always saw machines like that, whether they were different companies, Pixis, OmniCell, AccuDose, companies like that. We would see these machines in hospitals. Well, now we will allow long-term care facilities to have an automated machine for all the medications in a nursing home. And you can get permission to do that through the board, through the BNDD and the DEA. Uh, contact the board and the BNDD. And we give the registration for that to the pharmacy because in that instance, the DEA says that it's going to be an extension of the pharmacy. The pharmacy will supply the drugs, will stock the drugs. They will run the machine that goes back to the pharmacy computer. We will give a BNDD registration to the pharmacy, but it will say long-term care automated dispensing machine on it and it'll be at the address of where the machine is. And then you can get a DEA number just like it that'll be an automated dispensing machine but in a long-term care pharmacy. So we already have a handful of those around the state. I think the last time I looked we had five or six that I was aware of about a month or so ago. How do the mid-level practitioner prescribing limits relate to health care facilities such as hospitals? It all applies because the legislature gave them pres prescriptive authority for these orders. It follows them wherever they go. So whatever the nurse can do out in a clinic is what the nurse is allowed to do in a hospital. They're still limited. If they're going to work in a hospital when they give an order, uh, it's going to be similar. They, they, they have no authority in Schedule 2. They can only give orders in Schedules 3, 4, and 5. And then if it's for an opiate, it's a 120-hour maximum. So they really don't have that kind of an issue because they may not always be giving an order for five days in a row. But it just depends on how long the patient's going to be there. But the nurses give orders in a hospital the same way they would write the prescriptions out in a clinic. Going back to the e-kits, uh, do long-term care facilities fill out a 222 form to stock their C2 e-kit? No. Uh, the state rule specifically states that long-term care facilities can purchase drugs and they shall not use a 222 form because they don't have any. They don't have a DEA number, so they can't get 222 forms. So they can just take their BNDD registration and any other kind of a transfer document. They can use a form off our website. They can go to a pharmacy, a doctor's, or a hospital and get Schedule II drugs and buy them and transfer them without a 222 form. And that reminded me of something else. Uh, we've had some issues in the past where pharmacies thought that if they put drugs in the long-term care, a prescription has to be used. Well, one of the things that goes against that is we have some nursing homes that get their drugs 
from a hospital or a doctor. So there's no prescribing, dispensing of a prescription there. So that's another thing that speaks to that. Is a doctor allowed to use the hospital's DEA number if they have their own? No. The doctor uses their own DEA number for the jurisdiction they're in. They can use the hospital's DEA number with permission and then they add a suffix to it. But that's only for doctors that don't have a DEA number of their own. Concerning electronic prescribing, uh, they're asking, how, do you, how does your system know that it is receiving a prescription from a valid physician system, a certified one? That's a DEA question. I don't know. I, that, that, that's a good question. But it's kind of like that now. When you get a fax now, how do you know it's from a legitimate physician? And when you get a prescription in and you're not familiar with the doctor, how do you know it's legitimate real prescription? So the same questions exist on that. The, 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 the electronic system that's in place, I've been told, is supposed to be able to identify the doctor, know they're licensed, have their DEA number on it, where that it's, it even requires them to submit a full and complete prescription that if they leave something blank, it doesn't transmit. They get an error message. So it automatically gives the pharmacy a complete prescription. But that's one of those DEA questions. Well, we are out of time. Uh, we want to thank Mike for coming today to give his presentation and answer all these questions that we received. Um, we're now I'm going to go over the, um, again, the requirement for continuing education. Uh, I will announce that I'm going to close the program. Do not close your browser, and a little window will open up. You click OK, and then an, a web page will automatically open up that will have uh, some post-program uh, post, um, questions that you must answer. If you do not receive that web page, you can email compliance at pr.mo.gov, and we will email you the questions that were on that page. Um, again, certificates will be mailed out in seven to ten days uh, from the board office. Um, before we close, I just went next week on Thursday, August 15th. Uh, we will be having another webinar from 11.30 to 1. This will be the boards doing their annual update. We have had some uh, legislation that passed this year that will take effect August uh, 28th, and we also have a variety of rule changes that will be going into effect on August 30th. Uh, we will plan on talking about all of those uh, next week on Thursday, August 15th. Um, so again, Mike, thanks for coming today. Uh, I am now going to close the webinar.